Last fall, the president of our college challenged each of the faculty and staff to take on a personal challenge, a hard thing. I always love a challenge, so even though it had lots of balls in the air, I signed up. I was going to write my grandparents' immigration story. Four months later, though, I had nothing to show for it. I was tired and looking forward to catching up over Thanksgiving break when I met my guru in the parking lot. There she was, leaning against her car, looking cool. And I told her my plans, and she nodded and said to me, doing nothing, that's the hard thing. And I knew she was right. I knew that putting myself in the position to get the writing done, that was my hard thing, not the writing task itself. And I knew the research. I knew that Csikszentmihalyi said if we have a clear goal and a challenging task, it can lead to a sense of flow. I knew Erickson's research on deliberate practice, and he said we can usually just engage in that kind of intense focus for about an hour at a time. And I knew NASA's research, and he said that if we multitask, it breaks our concentration. But knowing and doing are not the same thing. And that is why I'm here today to talk to you about how to do nothing in order to do something. How do you do nothing in order to do something? First, you have to focus deeply. Excuse me, first you have to take time off. Then you have to focus deeply. First, take time off. Do nothing. It sounds easy, but it's not. Americans pride themselves on always working, always being connected. When I was living in Denmark, though, I experienced a different cultural value. Someone asked me, how many hours a week do you work? I was working at home at the time, and I had really no idea. Give a guess, she said. I didn't know. I could interrupt my day and take a break. I could go back to work in the evening. I really have no idea, I said. She narrowed her eyes and looked at me, and she said, you're always working, aren't you? And she was right. I never left the office. Implicit in that accusation was something decidedly undanish. I had no separation between my work time and my leisure time. And yet research shows that if we take time off and disengage, it increases both productivity and creativity. So I knew I needed to do something about it. So following the Jewish Sabbath, I committed to taking time off from Friday night until Saturday night, doing no academic work at all. And while that's not doing nothing, it's doing nothing that has anything to do with work. Now, taking time off is only part of it. Equally important is engaging with other people. We know that humans thrive on strong, positive relationships. In fact, when people engage with others in meaningful ways, their sense of well-being increases. And when people engage in social media, their rating of their own life satisfaction decreases. So it turns out how and when we engage is also important. We should engage with people in real life and not when we're meant to be doing other things. So I experienced this directly when my house was destroyed by Hurricane Harvey. Although I missed my material possessions, more than that, the hardest part was being disconnected from my community. Now when I take time off, I spend that time on Friday night and Saturday engaged with my community and my friends. Once you've learned how to take time off and do nothing, the next thing you need to do is do a little bit of nothing each day. Meditate. When I first learned to meditate, I went exactly where you might expect, rural, northeast, Scotland. Learning to sit still was hard. Quieting the voices in my head was even harder. But for me, the task that seemed almost impossible was finding time every day to do absolutely nothing. And I learned, both from taking time off during the week and taking a little time off each day, that I had to schedule and plan in order to be able to do nothing. So now, on my multicolored, very full Google Calendar, I also schedule time to do absolutely nothing. Now that you know how to do nothing, the next thing you need to do is take a deep dive into doing something. The challenge 
is to do only one thing, work intensely without interruption. When I first started to do this, what I did was I followed Cal Newport's idea of deep work combined with the Pomodoro technique. So I set my computer um, on do not disturb. I turned off all the alerts. I set my phone on do not disturb, and I closed all the windows that had nothing to do with my writing task. I set a 25-minute timer, and I sat down, and I did nothing but the work in front of me. If it was going well, I took a five-minute break and did it again. Being able to focus deeply increases our concentration. So that 25 minutes was deep concentration. The next thing you need to do is make it a habit. We know that when people make something a habit, when it becomes part of your routine, you anticipate the reward afterwards. And I know this from swimming. When I set my alarm for my early morning swims, I wake up before my 4.40 a.m. alarm in anticipation of the exhilaration that I feel after the swim. So I knew if I made writing part of my routine, I would also crave the reward, the sense of accomplishment that came with writing. So I set a schedule of writing that I knew I could keep so that it became part of my routine. This combination of taking time off and creating a routine was so important to me that I knew I had to share it with my students. But I also knew that students learn best when they can experience something. They're better able to apply and integrate the material when they learn it through experience. So I couldn't just tell my students they needed to focus. I needed to let them experience it. So this semester, in my general psychology class, once a week, all of my students deposit their cell phones in a basket in the front of the room. They're required to turn off all the alerts on their computers. And then we start class with a quiet breathing exercise for one minute. After that, for the next 25 minutes, they engage in a directed writing activity in complete silence. And do you know what? They say they really appreciate the time to focus, doing only one thing. Now, I know it sounds hard, but if I can get 20 college students to put aside their cell phones week after week, you can too. So, take time off and make it a habit. I know it sounds hard, but you can do nothing too. How do you do nothing? First, take time off. Truly do nothing. Make a clear separation between work time and leisure time. Engage with other people in real life. And then learn to meditate. Next, you have to do something. In this case, work deeply and then make it a habit. For me, working intensely has become like swimming. After recent neck surgery, I asked the surgeon if I could go back to lap swimming, and he told me no, but I could go into the pool and cool off if I wanted to. What was the point, I said. For me, I craved both the exercise of the swim and the exhilaration. I knew that standing in the pool to cool off would no more give me the benefit of swimming than multitasking would give me the benefit of writing. You can't multitask when you swim. You dive in and just swim. In that same way, working intensely allows me to do nothing but the work in front of me. Now, my grandparents knew this idea, and that's why I'm telling their story. My grandmother honed her focus through deliberate practice as a musician. It was through her that I learned the value of community. My grandfather, my opa, was a scholar. He would be pleased to know that I finally learned how to sit quietly. And once I learned how to do nothing, I started writing their story. Thank you.